Uh, dear friends, both here and online, Humphrey, uh, thank you so much. It's a great privilege, as always, to be here. Uh, and first of all, I, I do want to pay an enormous tribute to uh, Robin, uh, Margaret, and all those who've been responsible for putting together such a wonderful program today, and also for UPF generally, because David was absolutely right when he talked about the human tragedy of division of nations. I mean, it is... And we have to remember that the war in the Korean Peninsula was a civil war. It was not a war of external aggression. It was a civil war which brought in uh, other people. And that has all the hallmarks of the long-standing and evolutionary tragedy that comes with the division of, of people. And, and a, a really big tribute, I think, to uh, UPF generally, globally, for indefatigably pursuing this goal of trying to reunify the Korean Peninsula, which is so, so important to the people there. It's a hard task, but ably led and inspired by the late Dr. Moon and now his, his widow, Dr. Hak Chahan Moon, uh, the UPF internationally has never been backwards in pushing forward this, and, and I, I wish them Godspeed in that. But that, that sole declaration at the World Summit on uh, 13th of February 2022, which I've just had the privilege of, of signing at the back there, and I know all of you will if you haven't already done so, uh, called Towards Sustainable Peace and Prosperity on the Korean Peninsula, is an historic document. It is based on the promotion of international order, based on the UN Charter, and international law, two fundamental pillars if we are to see a new global governance uh, that is suited to all the people who inhabit this earth. It urges the two Koreas and the international community to pursue bilateral and multilateral diplomatic approaches to avoiding military confrontations, to which uh, uh, Humphrey referred just a moment ago with uh, some really serious issues actually unfolding now in the South China Seas. Maintaining and promoting peace, stability, and predictability, and increasing mutual understanding and confidence towards a complete, verifiable, and irreversible denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. It calls upon parties concerned to pursue a constructive dialogue with mutual respect, very important, and acknowledgement of each other's security interests. Again, if you do not acknowledge the person on the other side, what they want and what they need and what their concerns are, then how can you possibly reach uh, an accommodation? And also, uh, a concern and understanding on the shared cultural heritage of the two careers. And it wants to see confidence building measures, trust building programs and preventative democracy uh, involving major stakeholders working on the Korean Peninsula. But, what makes it remarkable, however, is the potential list of signatories, current and former heads of state and government, parliamentarians, high-level representatives, religious leaders, academicians, business and media leaders, first ladies, women leaders, and activists, and artists. Uh, all these are an important component, not as to political, but of civil, of civil and religious life in the world. And to have all those combining in this call is a very, very important aspect. Now, the Korean War of 70 years ago was, as I said, not a war between states, but a civil war of one people. And as such, left all the enmities and mistrust Recording in progress. that such wars imply, with families often split and a sense of resentment. It left a continuing technical state of war that endures to this day as it ended with an armistice and not a peace treaty. It is arguable that the USA has never fully become reconciled between North and South in their civil war that ended in 1865. So one can see the implications of what happened in the Korean Peninsula. Now for most of my adult life, the tension in Europe was palpable with direct confrontation of forces along what was then called the inner German border. I served in the military on that border and realized the magnitude of the real prospect 
of what was then called the Soviet Third Shock Army, which watched us from across the boundary making an attack. It is almost certain that the Soviets had the same misgivings about NATO. We lived under mutually assured destruction as a guarantor of peace, hardly comforting. The Soviet Union seemed a solid edifice. I remember going to Moscow as an MP at the invitation of the Soviet Academy of Sciences to discuss the prospects for mutual inspection of nuclear weapons tests. We met the Kremlin leaders, such as Georgi Arbatov, who served as an advisor to five general secretaries of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, and Nikolai Gerasimov, both uttering confidence in the solidarity of the state. And yet, within just a few years, it had been swept away. I mention this because none of us saw it coming. We could not imagine that the Berlin Wall should fall, and yet it did. And with a boldness for which Germany is still paying by equi giving equivalence to the Ostmark, to the Deutschmark, Chancellor Kohl initiated the reunification of Germany. Now, sadly, as David was pointing out, there are few experiences in history of a peaceful reunification other than that by force of arms. So there are parallels to be drawn with what happened in Germany. Now, I'm not suggesting that uh, the current dynasty in the DPRK, is, uh, its demise is imminent. There is very little evidence for that. But sometimes events surprise us. Despite the propaganda of the Eric Honecker regime and the control of dissent by the feared Stasi and denunciation by informants, the joy of the East Germans when once again they could freely connect with their fellow citizens in the West was overwhelming. There must be similar sentiment, albeit unexpressed for obvious reasons, amongst those living in the DPRK. As with Germany, however, we should not fall into error in thinking that there is total dissatisfaction with the regime. In the DDR, East Germany as it was called, you may have had to wait for 10 years or more to get your apartment or your Trabant car, but once you got them, they were yours and could not be alienated. With job security in the DDR, they looked across the border and saw in West Germany unemployment, social deprivation, and the downside of capitalism, as well as its glitter. When I went to East Germany, the DDR, as I mentioned, during the Cold War, I had wrongly imagined that Honecker would have wished his citizens to be ignorant of the benefits of the West. Yet, wherever we went, the television aerials were turned to the Western stations. We passed through one of the so-called two valleys of the clueless, a sarcastic description of two regions where there was no such TV signal. To my surprise, I learned that cable TV lines were actually being laid so they could get access to Western TV. It was superficially counterintuitive, yet it was a way of showing to the Eastern Germans that not everything in the West was a bed of roses. So greater knowledge of the grass being greener on the other side does not presuppose dissatisfaction with one's lot. We watch some of the TV series of Life for the Wealthy, and not so much, much out of increasing desire to be that way, but actually out of fascination. It is for these reasons that the admirable aspirations of the declaration about greater cross-cultural fertilization and trust building measures should not be seen as a threat to either the South or the North of Korea. And there is another lesson from the German experience. Reunification is expensive. The German economy is still paying for the courageous but costly decision of Helmut Kohl to give equivalence to the Ostmark with the Deutschmark, as I mentioned. The argument still rages between those who feel that the exchange of currency was the most practical way of quickly unifying the German economy, and others arguing that the, uh, that, 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 that the exchange increased the disruption caused by unification 
making Eastern German industries uncompetitive. The DPRK and South Korea, the, the Korean won, would be even harder to reconcile. The North Korean won is not traded in the international markets. It is traded in the unofficial black markets at around uh, one US dollar to 5,000 DPRK won as of 2021. But in 2019, South Korea's nominal gross domestic product amounted to around 1.919 trillion South Korean won, compared with that of the DPRK, which was approximately 35.28 trillion South Korean won. So South Korea's nominal GDP, therefore, was around 54 times greater than that of the DPRK. Are the people of South Korea, and perhaps the international community, prepared to pay such a price for reunification? Maybe this is a greater challenge than even the prospect of political unification with a newly forged common democracy. If there were a universal franchise, there is no doubt that the South would dominate the North. The population of DPRK is about 25 million, uh, approximately half that of South Korea. So for there to be meaningful discussions about reunification, these questions must be addressed. We meet during the 10th review conference of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty running between now and the 26th of August. As UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said on the 50th anniversary of the NPT's opening for signature in 2018 in Geneva, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty is an essential pillar of international peace and security and the heart of the nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation regime. Its unique status is based on its near universal membership, legally binding obligations on disarmament, verifiable non-proliferation safeguards regime, and commitment to the peaceful use of nuclear energy. Yet we are now a very long way, not just in history, but in attitudes from the heady days of the mccloy zorin Accord of 1961, which set out a pathway for complete disarmament. Indeed, it established a foundation or roadmap for all future negotiations and international treaties with regard to nuclear in general and complete disarmament under effective international control and effectively aiming at abolishing war as an institution. We must wait and see what influence the review conference may have on the seeming desire of DPRK to develop new missile and nuclear capabilities, as well as the saber rattling of both China and Russia in perfecting hypersonic missiles, which travel at three or four times the speed of sound. Attention is now enhanced, as I mentioned earlier, by what China is doing in asserting its sovereignty over Taiwan in the South China Seas. We also see, I'm glad to say, and Humphrey mentioned this, uh, an attempt by the World Federalist Movement uh, the Institute for Global Policy, to reinvigorate the talks on the three plus three, that's the two Koreas, Japan, China, Russia, and USA, for a Southeast Asia nuclear-free weapons zone. All of us need to support such measures in the hope that they may bear fruit. Ultimately, however, history may make its own running in whether or not this is achievable and reunification is brought to reality. Such issues will be decided by the heart, often, rather than by the head. Few foresaw German reunification, and we should not forget that many European countries were actively opposed to it in principle. Yet it happened. That same may be true of the Korean Peninsula. It will require both circumstance and political will to bring it about. Thank you very much.